Thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to our next uh, installation of Michigan Nature at Home virtual speaker series. Um, my name is Lauren Ross. I am the communications and events coordinator for the Michigan Nature Association. Um, and I'm joined tonight by my uh, colleague, Lorenzo Klein. He is our member services and administrative coordinator. And he's going to be uh, helping us out with this uh, presentation tonight. Uh, quick um, note about the webinar tonight. Um, we are going to be using the Q&A feature. So if you do have questions, um, please use the Q&A rather than the chat box. Um, that'll help us organize um, the questions a little bit better and be able to answer them in a timely manner. Um, if you do uh, want to just have side conversations, feel free to use the chat box, but please keep it civil with each other. Um, we're all here, you know, to learn and have a good time. Um, so we, we definitely encourage and appreciate um, people having conversations about the content, but do want to keep it uh, respectful. So um, our uh, speaker tonight is uh, Josh Haas. He is an avid bird and nature photographer um, about, based in Southwest Michigan. Um, he is the president of the Battle Creek Audubon and vice chair of the Hawk Migration Association of North America. And uh, Josh, I will let you continue uh, introducing yourself if you'd like. Um, I don't want to uh, make up your life story. So go ahead when you're ready. All right, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, just a few more things. I'm glad to be here. Uh, uh, can go ahead and get my share screen going, yeah? yeah. All right. Um, so just a couple more things about me. Um, obviously a very, very uh, big burger. Uh, started as a burger 15, 16 years ago. Um, pretty quickly got into photography um, and, you know, it really became my uh, subject matter of choice. So I love nature photography, but uh, anything bird related is really my, my preference. Um, and I'm excited to be here tonight uh, to just talk a little bit about some of the techniques that I use in the field, uh, share some stories uh, of some of my, uh, what I like to, to call my, my finest images, uh, as well as hopefully inspire you to get out there if you're a, a, um, a photographer or getting into it, uh, hopefully inspire you to get out there and uh, give it your best. So the last thing I'll say about myself is um, Raptor identification is uh, one of my strong suits and something that I've done for many, many years, uh, both counting for hawk watches as well as um, helping local nature centers as well as migration sites, both with uh, bird husbandry as well as counting uh, migrant uh, hawks right now. Fall is, is fall migration is on for raptors. We're switching over from broad wings to turkey vultures and budios uh, going into October. And it's a great time to get out there and, and hawk watch along the Great Lakes. So if you are interested in any of that, please visit hamana.org, H-A-M, excuse me, H-M-A-N-A.org. Also visit uh, my, my company's website, hawksonthewing.com, if you're interested in taking your Raptor ID skills to the next level. We'll talk a little bit uh, more about that at the end. But with that, I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started. So just to uh, check here, Lauren, can you see the screen okay? Yep, yep, looks good. Okay, just getting my panel set up here. All right, so I always like to start with uh, some sort of shorebird image. I, I love photographing shorebirds. It's a completely different style of photography than most birds. And uh, we're gonna talk about why that is. So I know being virtual, it's not as easy to engage and connect, but please open that question and answer area, ask questions, post comments. I'd love to see them. I do have that Q and A panel up on one of my monitors so I can monitor that. And uh, my first question to you is what do you like about this image? So feel free to use that Q and A uh, area if it'll let you and give me some of your comments about why you like this. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm not gonna wait. I'm gonna tell you what I like about this image. And so first and foremost, the level at which I photograph this bird, my hope is that you're noticing just how blurry everything is except for the bird itself. So the subjects popping off the screen and I'm doing that by using a very shallow depth of field. That's about as technical as I'm gonna to get tonight. I am not going to talk about technical complex camera jargon. The goal tonight is to just really have fun, talk about why these images are nice and inspire you to think about ways, non-technical ways of improving your own photography. So uh, the angle at which I'm shooting this image is incredibly low. 
And that's what creates that great blurred background. And as well, you don't see any of the nasty stuff that's actually right below the surface of the water. In fact, the surface of the water, th this is only an, maybe an inch, inch and a half, two inches deep. So uh, there's very, very little to see under the water, but it's kind of gross, mucky sand uh, kind of material. And if I were shooting down on this bird, you would see all that and you would never get this kind of look. Now, of course, it helps that this bird is doing something quite interesting. It's got its wings lifted up. It's certainly hunting. Uh, and, and we're going to talk a bit about posing uh, tonight, even though as bird photographers, we can't physically pose these birds like we can uh, humans, but uh, there are some cool techniques to, to uh, capture some unique poses. So when I say low, this is an example of just how low I am. I'm literally laying in the mud. You can see that I have a, um, a really cheap raincoat on. It's actually a rain suit that I wear when I shoot shorebirds and it can get nasty, dirty. I can crawl in the muck, in the sand all I want, and I stay pretty clean and dry inside. So uh, I can take that off after a nice session, rinse it off, and then it's good as new for the next time. So this is a this is how low I'm I'm talking about when I say get it, get low. Now, granted, not everybody can get down. Well, actually, it's probably not too hard to get down. It's usually the getting back up that's difficult. Um, if you find it difficult to get back up, uh, you know, just get as low as you can comfortably. Don't worry if you can't get this low. Just the lower you get, uh, the better uh, angle that you're going to see. Now, of course, this is a very common shorebird that we see all over the place. One of the first birds that I learned as a young child, just seeing these and hearing them in the schoolyard, you know, running away and the, the, the moms acting like they're injured, trying to pull us away from their nest. Um, but you know what? The majority of the time that, that I see these birds is, is just like I just described in grass or pebbly kind of uh, sand yards. It's, it's never in a situation like this, but they're out there. They're a shorebird and many of your local watering holes just aside from, you know, roads and farm fields will support lots of killdeers just like this. Getting down at this angle, shooting very low at the birds, the subject's perspective is, is essential for a shot like this. And it just makes a very common bird all of a sudden look quite beautiful. I think they're just stunning, stunning birds. So here's another uh, example of me shooting low, actually on a beach. So this is pretty clean, it's just sand. Uh, sand isn't my favorite, but it is what it is when a red knot shows up on the shores of, great, of the Great Lakes, that's a good bird, um, it's worth doing that. So I don't know if you can look around the screen, hopefully you can see the direction in which I'm shooting. You might be able to find the bird. It's actually just off to the left from the, the blue water's edge. And this is a perfect example on the screen showing what an image of this bird would look like shooting at, you know, five, six feet above uh, the ground all the way down. Uh, someone's asked what the first species uh, was, and that's a Dunlin. So great, great question. Um, so again, this is a red knot. This is a great example showing what it would have looked like had I stayed standing fully erect, shooting down on the bird. However, being at my angle, shooting at the bird's point of view, I get rid of all that nasty junk that we saw in the last image. My depth of field is so shallow. When I say depth of field, it's, it's this range of area that's in focus. Basically the bird itself, not even, probably about half of this bird is in focus and past about the halfway point of the bird and further beyond, it starts to get blurrier and blurrier and blurrier or out of focus. And that's what gives this great bokeh look and this this subject matter being able to pop right off the screen. Another example, beach photography, early morning on the shore of Lake Huron. This is a piping plover. You can tell, uh, look at its ankles. It's a color banded bird. So uh, the biologists can tell exactly which individual this is. That was great. When I posted this on Facebook after I shot it, uh, they had one of the biologists from the DNR happened to be in my feed and they came right on and put a comment for everybody explaining which individual this is, where it typically breeds, all sorts of information about it. It was really neat uh, for our followers. But the important thing that I want to put out to you now is I tell you what, as a photographer, it's been very frustrating over the last five to 10 years watching people's, uh, you know, resilience to printing 
uh, increase. They just don't want to print anything anymore. So many people just want images on their phones, their iPads, whatever the device is, and they're good to go. Do not be afraid to print your images. It is a lot of fun. And also consider matting and framing your images as well. I mean, my office at work, my office here, I mean, our house is full of this stuff and we can switch things in and out as we get new work. Uh, and it's a lot of fun to kind of play with complementary colors. And uh, the basic, you know, starting point that I, I really like, especially with anything nature related is just keep to earth tones with your matting. If you keep to earth tones, try to find something complementary in the image to bring out with your color of your mat it can really make an image come to life. Also notice that I took this wide format aspect ratio, so this landscape shot, and now I've gotten rid of a lot of the dead space on the left and right side of the bird, and I've put a lot more focus on the bird by cropping down into what's called a portrait aspect ratio. So now all the focus is on the bird. You see that little bit of granularity in the sand at the, at the base, but everything screams, look at the bird. And so don't be afraid to either crop like that and be thinking about how you're going to crop in post-processing, or don't be afraid to take your camera and flip it 90 degrees and shoot in portrait right in the field. Either way works great. So I, you know, I've started this by really encouraging everybody to get low for this style of uh, photography. But you know what? Sometimes you don't have to get low. This looks like I'm very low, but the funny part about this is this image was taken, uh, uh, and this is a solitary sandpiper. This this was one of two birds that had flew in in migration and was in the UP, basically uh, feeding in a creek on top of about a five and a half, six foot tall waterfall. So I'm downstream, standing fully erect with my tripod fully. Um, totally out camera right at, at, at face level shooting this bird and it looks like I'm laying at the creek's edge because there just happened to be a waterfall and it was upstream of the waterfall. So this is one of these rare occasions where I could really comfortably shoot this bird and not have to uh, get down and dirty into the muck. So every now and then the stars align and you can get get lucky. And you know not every uh, shot that is photographed low is for shorebirds. This is a Louisiana water thrush and it's a type of warbler, but they spend the majority of their time right at river or creek's edge. And so this is a bird that's oftentimes very, very low. So in this particular instance, I wanted an image of this, of this bird very, very low to tell a story. Photography is all about uh, you know, a medium to tell a story. And so I don't like full frame images of the bird and nothing around it. I like to show some of the bird's environment. And I just believe that really tells a little bit more uh, of a story. And I'll tell you, anyone who looks at my images, anything that's, you know, totally cropped in just on the bird, they, they tend to just flip through quickly. Something that's backed off a little bit with other interests in, in the foreground and background, they tend to stay a little longer, which tells me they're interested in it. They're looking at it. They're wondering what, what's going on in this image. What is this bird thinking about? What is it doing? And that's the kind of connection that I like to create with uh, my viewers. Now, getting away from shooting low, there are some really easy techniques to photograph birds right from your, your deck, your kitchen window, you know, right at home, especially with, with birds as tame as ruby-throated hummingbirds here in the East Coast. Um, so I don't know about you, but when I started photographing ruby-throated hummingbirds, the first thing that I noticed is the birds love to be on the back side of the feeder. So I had a lot of shots where either just the feeders in, in view and you can kind of see the reflection of the bird in the, in the feeder itself, but no bird prominently displayed. Well, a little trick, if you look really close on that right side, there's a packaging tape that I've used to cover up all but one of the holes uh, for the hummingbirds to feed at. And so if you look where the hummingbird is, where he is perched is the one open feeding hole. And what's interesting is these birds will approach the feeder and they don't 
they don't perch and land right away. They, they first will hover and, and try to get into the feeder holes to get uh, nectar before they'll settle and feed. And they'll go all the way around until they find an open hole. And when they find that one open feeding hole, they'll, they'll settle, they'll perch, and then they'll just hang. And that's, this is your result. So it's a really nice place to start. It's kind of a cool common sense trick to, you know, kind of get you into this mindset of some more common sense techniques to capturing things uh, without having to be, you know, luck of the draw in the middle of nowhere and you just happen upon, you know, a great subject uh, matter. So we can take this uh, a step further though. And this is a wild columbine with, again, another ruby-throated hummingbird, probably the same one that was at the feeder of the last shots. And what I've done is if you can picture just off, off screen to the right of this columbine is the feeder. And once I have birds coming into that feeder and they're regularly feeding from my one feeding uh, hole, I will cover the last hole. So now all the feeding is blocked off on that feeder. And then I'll take an either zip tie or somehow mount uh, this little, you know, flower, uh, whether it be a columbine or something else, I'll, I'll mount it so that it hangs just off from the feeder. And what happens is these birds will then try to go back to their feeding hole. They'll realize that it's not there. And the next best offering is my flower. And so they'll immediately, almost every single time, they'll immediately go to that columbine and start feeding. So now what we see is a completely natural image that doesn't show anything man-made or non-natural. And so that's kind of what I'm after. And the, the next images you're going to see, this is a plain capped star throat, a pretty rare hummingbird that uh, we were lucky to see in Southern Arizona. Same technique applies, picture feeders to the side and right under this little flower. Uh, the feeders are attracting all these hummingbirds in and, you know, as luck would have it now at a place like, like this, I didn't have control to just block off the feeders. Um, and there were so many hummingbirds, we wouldn't want to do that anyway. Um, but because there's so many hummingbirds at some point, they're, they're going to hit your flower. So it's just a matter of waiting. So all of these images are a result of this exact technique. I just happened to bring all this kind of gear with me to Southern Arizona on one of our trips. This is a Lucifer hummingbird, another rare one uh, that uh, typically spends most of its time in Mexico. And lastly, our Rufus hummingbird. If you go west of the Mississippi, you can get Rufus hummingbirds, especially out, you know, towards California. They're pretty easy to get. Um, but one of the things you can do with these birds, they're really active at the feeders and they're very territorial. They will go after all the other hummingbirds. And so these birds are fun to focus on because they'll hover, they'll flare their tail feathers like we see here. They do a lot of really interesting aerobatic stuff that oftentimes is, you know, in a single location right near your feeder and they'll just stay in this little spot. So it can actually be easy to focus on them and get some shots like this. So every now and then I do like images of, of hummers where there's no flowers. It's just showing them flying and, and seeing the tail like this is everything for this image. Now, this is the same bird, but I've literally moved myself just a few feet to the right and changed my point of view. So now my background is a dark pine tree uh, tree line. And because it's so far away from where I'm shooting this, this hummingbird, and it's so much darker than the hummingbird itself, I've adjusted my camera's exposure to make sure I'm exposing for the hummingbird not the background. And because of that, it makes that dark tree line look really, really dark. So essentially going from this to this is just adding drama. And so don't be afraid to, you know, look around and move and, and look beyond your subject to figure out, hey, what, what else is back there that I could just move a few feet and change, uh, change the image drastically. This is literally the same bird I've just moved a couple feet to the right to change my background. So a lot, oftentimes, especially with non-feeder birds, um, the, the common problem that we have is getting close to them. And so this is where concealment really is your best friend. When you're talking about things like, especially like ducks, migrating ducks especially, uh, concealing yourself is key. This is a great example of a little workshop I was doing years ago. And I quickly basically just took two 
half sheets of, of, I think it was OSB kind of plywood, cut little windows, made little doors, hinged it so that it could be, you know, 16 feet wide. And that meant that we could, all the participants could lay in a row right in front of that and shoot into the water and the ducks really couldn't see us that were floating by. And oftentimes what happens with birds like shorebirds and, and ducks is you'll walk into your spot, you'll flush, a, flush them um, because they you know, don't wanna be near you, but they'll oftentimes slowly just start moving back in. So it pays to just settle in, take some time, just kind of hang out and experience nature before you even get your camera going. And, you know, within a half hour, oftentimes the action will present itself again. Little trick, uh, especially around this time of year when hunting season's upon us, a lot of times these little pop-up uh, tent blinds will be for sale. And it's a great, um, a great little trick for um, concealing yourself on the cheap. And you can set these up right in your backyard uh, near your feeders. You can start with feeder birds and then get used to some of your techniques and then move out into other more wild areas uh, if you have permission uh, to get closer to some of those birds. So we do have a question, how close the birds are that I'm shooting and what lens am I using? Uh, most of the time, the lens I'm using is a 500 millimeter prime. Uh, prime meaning it doesn't zoom. So I can't zoom in or out with that lens. And the, the reason that I prefer that is there's less glass elements because there's not a zoom and the less glass elements in a lens means much higher quality picture. So oftentimes the problem is never that I'm too close to the birds. That's a very rare thing. Um, oftentimes you don't have enough uh, focal length. You're not close enough. Uh, in terms of the feeder birds, I'm oftentimes with a 500 millimeter, I'm, you know, 15, 20 feet from these birds. With a 400 mil, 300 or 400 millimeter, like a lot, of, a lot of people start out with, that's what I started out with. Um, you need to be a little closer yet. You want to be close enough that you get that really nice blurred background with your shallow depth of field. For the ducks that we're going to see right now, uh, this is a pie build grebe. This is actually pretty distant because it's, it's pretty cropped. So um, this one's quite a ways out, probably 50, 40, 50 feet at least. This one, not so much, it's pretty close. It's probably 25, 30 feet out. Um, this, I'm at, this is a blue wing teal, by the way. The last one was a pied billed grebe. And the blue wing teal, this is where they get their name. So often when I'm you know, leading local bird, bird tours, we'll find blue wing teals and, and beginners will ask, well, why is it called a blue wing teal? There's no blue on that bird. And the answer is always, well, let's just wait. If we see one fly, you're going you're gonna to figure out why. And then all of a sudden, bam, you get this huge um, blue tab or blue color. And, and now you get it. Um, so this is, again, another example where I'm, I'm, I'm actually in the water uh, for this shot. This is a little, little bit more advanced technique. Um, but being at the water's edge, like we saw in that concealment photo, you would get the same, same effect if, if it would have been shot from there, same level. Um, this is actually, you get a nice low point of view, but I'm actually not laying at the water's edge. I'm on a kayak on an open water lake, and I'm kind of leaned back, leaned down as far as I can go to be as low as I can go shooting these birds. And the cool thing about common loons is they're pretty accepting uh, of people, especially if you're in a boat, and you can kind of really uh, gauge whether the, the bird has comfort or not. Um, you can, you know, a lot of these birds, it pays to learn about, you know, what they like, what they don't like, what, um, what brings them uh, to the point where they're kind of like not comfortable. You can, there's a lot of tells that you can see. The, the common loons will start looking around a lot. They'll be looking at you and around and trying to figure out what's going on. They might start murmuring a little bit, making some noises. That's really a good clue to, Take your paddle and slowly just back away a little bit. And oftentimes I've found that you just go back, you know, just a few feet from where that behavior started and they'll tend to quickly go back to what they were doing. So it's really important that you kind of keep an eye on that. And that's another reason concealment's so nice because the birds really don't know you're there so much. And so not only do they act more naturally, they're just more comfortable, period. And we want the birds comfortable. You don't want them on edge. So good questions there. So speaking of feeder birds, don't be afraid to go after the most common 
birds. It's just a black capped chickadee. It's just the Northern Cardinal. It is to us in the Midwest. I mean, we see these things all year long, but there's something very different about this very pastel, smooth, blended colored background. You've got this little pine bough with pine cones that starts curving up across uh, the screen, just adding some interest to the image. And then the pose is just so calming uh, of this black cap chickadee. It's one of my favorite images, and yet it's just a black cap chickadee. So don't be afraid to really go for improving these uh, common bird photos and doing some different things, offering different perches. So let's talk about what that looks like. So you're going to see in this video, this is kind of a setup area on my property right before a workshop. So you've got, I'm gonna pause the video and hopefully you can see my cursor. This is the main feeder here. It's basically a platform feeder. And now I have perches on tripod set up, leading birds down to the uh, platform feeder. And on top of that, I've taken a piece of cardboard and covered the entire platform, except maybe a, a four by four or three inch by four inch hole. So basically only one or two birds can get at the, the food at a time. And what that does is it forces the other birds to wait and guess where they wait. They wait on my perches more often than not. And on top of that, selecting a good perch is an art form. You don't just want to get a stick. Maybe that's something to do at first. So you kind of start to get your technique down. But once you start to figure out how to get these birds in and you're being successful, um, start looking deeper for perches that have really nice elements, um, you know, lichens, mosses, things like that. And this is a perfect example of that. Now you notice on the right hand side, these big logs that I've got, this is a Christmas tree stand I got like for just a couple bucks right after Christmas one year. These are great for um, vertical uh, perches like this. And what I'll do is I'll make homemade suet. Um, and maybe Lauren can put that either in the chat or the question and answer area. My recipe is one part peanut butter, one part cornmeal, one part lard. And the beauty, beauty of that combination is you don't have to refrigerate it. It'll sit forever and it's fine. On top of those three one-to-one -one, uh, parts of the, the recipe, I'll add some nice mixed seed to it, bird seed to it, just to bring you know something valuable to the birds. Mix all that up. And what's cool about it is it stays really nice and soft, even in the freezing cold. Notice here it's winter. And this is very pliable. It's not like the suet cakes that are hard as a rock that you buy at the store that become even harder <laughs> in the winter. It stays pliable. And what I'll do is I'll take a drill uh, and maybe like a three quarter inch drill bit, depending on the size of the perch. And on the side of that, of let's say this big log here on the side and maybe just going towards the back, I'll drill a hole kind of diagonally going down. Depending on the log, I'll go as deep as I can without, you know, breaking the log. And then I'll just stuff suet in these holes. And I'll maybe do, pick my location of that hole based on the interest elements that are on that perch. So if there's one area of the log that has some nice mosses or lichens, I'll drill the, the hole near that. So that adds elements of interest to my image. On top of that, I'll also choose my hole accordingly so that where I'm shooting from, I don't have all this nasty white and brown as my background. I have this nice dark tree line as my background. So you really need to think about not only where your subject's gonna be, but also what's beyond your subject. And you'll notice we haven't talked at all about how we expose, how we set the camera up. All of this is just non-technical stuff that will just make your photographs go to the next level. So let's finish this video. You can notice, there are just birds like crazy flying in and out. I'm not even in the blind yet. I'm literally standing in front of the blind. They don't even care I'm there. So in winter like that, I love winter songbird workshops because the birds just, they love coming in. It makes it a lot of fun. And here's your result. So just beyond the belly of this white-breasted nuthatch is a little hole with suet. And I put it there on purpose to take advantage of some of this little mossy material on other what otherwise would be a pretty boring stick.
American Robin, very common bird, but beautiful, especially in winter going after sumac berries. I, I love this image, nice complementary natural earth tone background. I like the blending of colors, how especially the lower left starts to go in and match some of the colors in the bird's belly. It's kind of like decorating a house. You got to look at what colors go well together. So taking it a step further, this is a, an old decrepit fence post on the side of a road just, just outside of Tawas, Michigan. And I happened to be prepping and scouting for bird locations for a workshop that was going to happen um, shortly after. And I kept driving this particular road and I happened to notice that a single Savannah Sparrow was spending a lot of time on this one fence post. Every time I drove by, he was singing from this fence post, not the one 30 feet to the left, not the one 30 feet to the right, this particular one. Birds are very habitual. They love to do the same thing a lot of times. And this was this guy's perch. And so I waited for my participants to get up. And what we did is um, as I'm taking people around, you know, I'm, I'm watching this location just to see is that bird still there? Is the bird still there? It just kept, kept showing up. It was still there. So you'll notice I, I've taken some grasses, just dead grasses from the side of the road, put that on top of the fence post. So it looks like there's nothing solid for the bird to land on. Then I've zip tied a perch that goes maybe eight or 10 inches above the fence post. And what I'm doing with that is creating uh, just a slightly higher area for the bird to perch. Birds like to be at the highest level. And so I'm just trying to force the bird to, when he comes back to his fence post, land on my natural perch. And I've done that by placing it a little higher than the fence post. The other thing that that's allowing for, when I shoot from the other side of the road, now I have this nice dark green background. I'm not shooting up and getting this nasty white sky in this overcast day. I'm shooting so that this nice green background is, is the backdrop for this particular bird. And so we set this up and then we're on the other side of the road, all you know, parked, camped out on top, cameras sitting on top of my car, waiting. And here comes the bird, comes right in on its own. Uh, and it kind of flies a little bit around the perch. You could tell it noticed, hey, something's off here. It went to the next one, came back. And the third time it flew by, it landed on that perch. And this is the end result. But the beauty of uh, what I love about this image so much outside of just, you know, the angle, the way the perch is covered in lichens, it just offered this great right angle uh, level perch for the bird to sit on, which most birds really like. Um, all of that came together with a nice, smooth, transitioned green background. And we didn't use any audio. We didn't use any kind of attractant to bring this bird in. We took advantage of the bird's natural behavior and what, what habits um, it was exhibiting that day. And so just a wonderful experience um, all on the side of a road. You'd never know, it's just on the side of this little road. So pretty fun. This is another example. This is a Henslow sparrow, pretty rare bird that's, that's tough to see. Um, and this perch right here, this perch right here with the green leaves is not the same plant as this composite. But what I noticed, this is on my grassland field here at my property. When this bird showed up, I when I heard it and I went out and, and just sat and I just watched the bird sing and I watched it, just experienced what it was doing. And I noticed that there were basically three, it was kind of hitting three perches in a triangle and over and over it hit a perch and it's sing and then go to the next one and sing. And so what I did is I just took some nice additional flowers and waited for the bird to go to the next perch, crawled in real quick, zip tied these flowers so they looked kind of nice backed off and it didn't take but a few minutes and the bird was back on its same perch that it preferred, singing its little heart out. Again, no audio, no other attractants. I just experienced the bird doing what it was doing naturally. Now I'm gonna tell you, it's not always this easy and it doesn't always present itself this way, but when it does, you can absolutely capitalize on it. Again, no camera tips here, just setting yourself up for quality action look at my background. I'm looking beyond the subject to make sure it's, it's not 
full of, you know, half sky, half trees. That's an exposure nightmare. It looks dirty. It doesn't allow the bird to pop off the screen. Look beyond your subject, make sure it's nice and clean. And this is the kind of result you can get. This happened this spring, clay colored sparrow in, in, in my county here in Southwest Michigan, uh, in this beautiful big uh, prairie. And it kept singing from two or three little perches, same kind of deal, capitalized on it, adds, added some of these flowers that happened to be on the side of the road. Unfortunately, they're a non-native. I don't recall what, um, what type of flower that is, but, um, but from a, a, a visual perspective, it certainly added a lot of color to what was a pretty brown and green image. And lastly, this is an Eastern towhee, and I, I was not in this location going after Eastern towhees. I was photographing a yellow warbler that was kind of hanging around the side of the road, absolutely on territory. I was just kind of hoping to get some shots. And wouldn't you know it, this towhee just kept coming into this particular broken off log. And so, hey, if he's coming into one spot, I'm going to take advantage of it. I was lucky enough that I didn't have to like reposition. I could just turn and get, get a nice angle on the bird. But to me, you know, this, this wet old log doesn't do anything for this image. And on top of that, I'm backed off a little bit and this log is in the frame as well. And so I have a little secret spot, um, not too far from where I live, where there's this boggy wetland with just down trees all over the place and mosses everywhere. And so every now and then I'll go and, and collect a, a little bit of moss and I'll put it in Ziploc bags and just always have it with me. This is why I always have it with me. What I did is when the bird flew off, I got some of my mosses out of a bag. I just covered up that same little log. Now I've, I basically changed my angle. I got down a little lower, which means now I'm shooting lower and shooting a little bit up, which meant that that other log is just below the frame here. So that took that out of the frame. All you see is a nice green mossy uh, perch with a, a nice complementary green background and boom, that black and orange bird is, is prominently there. Never planned to shoot this bird. It just was an opportunity that presented itself. That's the before and after. Now this is, this is from my property as well. I'm gonna walk you through how I set this up. And we happened to notice uh, about four years ago, American Kestrels really spending a lot of time on our grassland property. So we put up a box hoping they'd take over. Long story short, they love the box. They are in this box every year and we have at least one or two uh, young ones leave the box every year. But what this has done for our property and for, for our family is we get to enjoy kestrels for the better part of spring and summer. Um, and, and it's great. They hang around, they're hunting, they're all over the place. And what I noticed is uh, these birds just, just on the backside of our, our lawn area, there is this old fence post with this metal, I don't even know what it is, it's a piece of pipe that goes up and then it has this little, little right angle didn't mean to do that little right angle piece here and the birds would come and land on this and they would hunt the grassland just sitting right there looking for mice voles, or whatever so what i did remember that savannah sparrow shot birds especially raptors want to be as high as possible and so i pulled that pole down i went up to my little spot where there's some of these really cool uh, pine trees nabbed a uh, uh, a nice little perch that I thought would look nice. And if you notice, I've attached it so that this level part, this parallel part of the branch is, you know, it's a good eight, 10, 11 inches above that other perch. So with this being here, it's blocking the bird from landing on it. And really, if it wants to land anywhere near this pole, its only choice is somewhere on that pine bow. Now, how do we shoot? Let me go back. How do we shoot? I'm at ground level shooting up at this perch. How do I photograph a bird without this disgusting overcast gray sky? What I want to look at is this tree line. Well, as, as it turns out, I have a walkout ranch. And so this is our basement. This would be our first floor. And this happens to be a window in, in my bedroom. So I basically took the screen out of, of this window and just set it aside. And I basically just have my camera sitting there 
set up for roughly the exposure that I, I know will work well. And it's just sitting there waiting. And every time I'm at home working or doing whatever, if I'm inside, I'm sitting at the table in the dining area and I'm watching through our glass slider waiting for a bird to perch. And sure enough, bird comes in, lands on it. That was that initial American kestrel image that you saw. This again shows by putting my myself, my point of view, uh, you know, a good 20, 20, 23 feet up. Now I'm shooting at the level of this pine bow, which means I'm shooting kind of down. And this tree line back here becomes my background instead of this gross overcast sky. And one day, not only did that same male come in and land, a female joined him. So you can imagine my excitement as I'm working away on the laptop in my dining room. And I notice this, I get to the camera and no joke, a snow squall hits. And this is the resulting image. I mean, it's just a wonderful, I mean, totally John James Audubon-esque in my mind, you know, just looks so classic. Um, and to have the snow squall in the background with the pair uh, was very exciting moment. So uh, one of my favorites uh, from several years ago. Now, speaking of snow, you'll notice that as I've gone to this American tree sparrow, the snow is visible, but it's a little less visible. And the reason for that is the background. It's not real dark. So your number one rule when you want, when you've got snow coming down and you want to add that as an element of interest to your images, your first rule is going to be find a setup or a location for yourself where your background is super dark. The darker your background, the more the snow is going to show. These are common red poles. If you're a birder and you were around this last winter, you probably experienced lots of common red, red poles. They absolutely erupted into our area. Um, and so we had them all winter at our property. I mean, it got to a point where I was bored shooting these birds. There were so many all the time. And so it was a really nice thing to have something so new and so prevalent. Um, but again, look at how dark that background is. That's what's showing all of that beautiful snow. Now we go a little darker. Look at how much snow you're seeing in this bald eagle image. Now I had to step up onto like a, um, a steel fence kind of thing. I don't know what to call it to get up high enough so that that background was a low dark tree line where the birds were kind of circling coming in to hunt on the on a, a, a side of river essentially. Had I been down lower, in fact, I have shots where I started where the birds coming in with a, the, the sky, which of course it's snowing, so it's pure clouds. And you don't notice any of the snow in the entire shot unless you're looking over the dark feathers of the bird. The only place you can see snow is on top of the bird. So all of this right here, you could see everything outside of it. You couldn't even tell it was snowing. And that was my aha moment, like, oh, duh you need a dark background so the white snow is visible. So seems like really basic and common sense, but in the moment when you have a bald eagle hunting in front of you, you really have to take a step back and think about these things. And it's very hard to do when you've never experienced something like that and it's right in front of you. So always be willing to take a step back and, and think before you um, go shooting. So continuing on with birds in flight, you know, this is a nice shot when you're going to a hawk watch or, you know, first time you're, you're doing this. I know for me, I'd walk away with that thinking, yes, I got it. The bird's sharp. It's in the frame. You can tell it's a kestrel. Uh, this is a good day. But, you know, as your skill level goes up and you're shooting more and more, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be going after much more unique images. And so this is like a gliding bird that's just gliding by. And anything where the wings are, you know, parallel to you or at your same level, to me is, is boring. I want to see something either totally backside or underside of the bird uh, to just give a much more interesting image. I mean, look at the coloration in the same bird, literally the same individual. What a difference just it turning and banking and me being ready to hit the shutter uh, makes. So often when, you, when you're new to this and you go to a hawk watch and it's a busy day, you've got birds flying left and right, you're just like hammer down, do, 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 you know, shooting everything. 
again, you're so excited in the moment, you're not thinking. You really have to force yourself to just stop and think about what you're doing. And my my preferred way of shooting birds in flight, especially like a kestrel comes by, I'm following it in the frame and I'm practicing always, even if it's a bird I'm not going to shoot and it's flying, I'm practicing trying to follow it because it's very, very hard to do. Um, I'm always following it and it's not until they get to a certain moment where I'll do a little group of shots and then I'll keep following and then maybe another group of shots, keep following, then a few more shots, but it's just little groupings, maybe two or three times. And that is much more, uh, much more easy to deal with, especially in post-processing when you're reviewing images. So don't, I know that it's digital for most all of us and your quick knee jerk reaction is, well, it's, it doesn't cost me anything. What's the big deal? Well, I'll tell you what the big deal is when you have 5,000 images from a Hawk watch to go through, that's a big deal. I would much rather spend my time back out in the field shooting than going through image after image after image, trying to find something that looks like this. So think about it, you know, stop and really evaluate how you want to, you know, show that moment. Forester's turn, we know that because of the frosty wingtips. They look very similar to common turns. Um, but this is a forester's turn, forked tail, beautiful hunting adult. And, you know, oftentimes it's that gliding shot where they're flapping and they're just looking, they're very erratic flyers. And all of a sudden they'll see something and they'll put the brakes on, swoop around. A lot of this is luck. You just have to really be following again, doing some little groups of uh, burst shots. And sometimes, man, you can get it just right when the bird tends to move, you know, fly around, flare all of its primary feathers. And this is the kind of pose that you can get. I mean, of, of the, you know, hundreds of images that I walked away with that day, this was absolutely my favorite. I mean, just the pose, the look on its face, you can absolutely, absolutely tell what this bird is doing and it's about to turn around and go down. And so to me, that story is just, just perfect. Now you might've seen in that initial slide with the kestrel gliding that I was also mentioning birds overhead versus birds at their angle. This is no different than the shorebird stuff we opened with. It's all about, for me, it's all about getting at the bird's level. That's easier said than done at a hawk watch because they're oftentimes high and flying overhead. So how do you do that? Well, you have to deal with what cards you're dealt. If it's a clear day at a hawk watch and the winds are right, they're not going to be low. They're going to be stratospheric. They're going to be so high. All your shots are going to look like this. But if you got partly cloudy skies or even cloudy skies, a heavier than normal wind, heavier winds will put those birds down. As a photographer, those are the days that I'm going to a hawk watch. Again, as a photographer, it doesn't mean that on those clear days, I'm not going to hawk watch. I might see thousands of birds. It just might not present good images. So you just have to kind of get into this mindset of what creates a good atmosphere for images and then capitalize when you know that weather is there. So this is a Swainson's hawk, uh, something that's quite rare in Michigan. They're more of a Western bird. Um, and this is just a, a nice example of an overhead shot. I don't have a whole lot of Swainson Hawk images. So of course I'm very happy with this, especially to have shot this in Michigan is very exciting, but I would much rather have an image like this. And the result of this was a heavy wind day at Whitefish Point, uh, heavy winds to the point where they weren't crossing, they would get to the point and then they kind of mill about fly around, they'd be low because the winds were so high. I wasn't even on the hawk deck, if you're familiar with whitefish, I was way out on the beach, way low. So I'm not even, I'm not even at treetop level, I'm on the beach, but the winds were such that these birds were so low, this particular angle that I caught this bird at, it looks like I'm in the sky at the bird's angle. That is a keeper for me any day. So that just kind of shows you the difference. Now I have to say though, this is my opinion. And as a photographer, I absolutely like the juvenile red tail that's prominent on the screen right now. But I've talked to a lot of photographers at Hawk Watches that absolutely love these overhead, you know, where they're shooting straight up. They love this image. They like to see the underside of that bird, just as you see it here. And that's okay. You as a photographer need to decide what you like. You don't have to do what Josh says, but it's a good starting point. Another one, one of our kestrels, I'm sitting with my daughter in a tent, you know, not far away from the box. 
And here's this bird flying around like crazy in evening light. That's what makes this image. This is right at sunset. Not only is it a, a predominantly orange, tawny looking, you know, underside of the bird. Now it looks absolutely orange because of all that evening sunlight just blowing this bird up. So bluebirds, this is a bluebird box at my mom's property. Uh, she calls me every year. Um, she calls me every year when, uh, when they, the young have hatched. So this, this is an example where you've got two adults, male and female, bringing food in like crazy. That's when you wanna shoot bluebirds. Um, once those birds are out of the eggs, but still really young and in that box, they're coming and going like crazy. And it just offers a great opportunity. So what I've done is I've set my gear up on a tripod. The birds of course are coming into the hole. So I, I pre-focus on the hole with my autofocus, but then I turn autofocus off and I just move the camera's frame so that I'm, I'm basically shooting right in this area here. And you'll see my nice tree background. Um, judging by the shadows, you can see the sun's mostly behind me. So it's going to light the birds up. And basically I have a, a remote release and I'm just sitting watching the birds stage in the tree off to the left. And as soon as they start to fly and come in, I'll put the shutter down using my remote release. And this is, this is kind of the opposite of just shooting in tiny little groups. You will walk away with a ton of images that are no good, but for every hundred or 200 images that are bad this is the kind of thing that you can walk away with. It's actually, it, it sounds a little complex. It, it may sound a little complex, but it's pretty easy once you get it down and you're just enjoying them. Your face isn't plastered in front of a camera. You're using a remote release and just putting the hammer down every time they fly in. And this is the kind of stuff that you can get. And so just something as simple as bluebirds right in your backyard, you know, or someone's backyard that you should know. Everybody should probably know someone that has bluebirds. Um, on their property. Very similar technique. Um, very similar technique in terms of birds in flight. This is a purple martin, and I'm shooting this bird right along this massive colony. So there's hundreds of these birds coming and going, easy peasy. I say easy peasy. I'm tracking these things. They're like little rockets. Most of the images I walk away with are junk, but then every one of, you know, a couple hundred, you, you get something like this. My advice to you with birds in flight is to start with something much easier than, um, you know, those purple martins. Start with sandhill cranes, Canada geese, something that doesn't fly real erratically, nice, smooth, and just practice panning with the birds. So one of the last things I want to talk about is related to background. We can see that there's a barn in the background of this beautiful northern harrier shot. Absolutely ruins the image for me. Really watch out beyond your subject look beyond it, be set up in an area where you can have a nice free flowing natural background. You'll see here that there's something really nasty in the background. This is terrible. This is more what we're, we're going after, okay? So always look beyond. It's, it's hard to do in the moment when you have this new species you've never seen and you can, you're 10 or 12 or 15 feet from it, you can get a nice shot. And then you realize there's a lady with a bright pink hat in the background. You don't know that till you get home and it is what it is. Go for those smooth backgrounds. That's a Blackburnian warbler. This is a, a, a Blackpole warbler, chickadee looking bird <laughs> with a paint job. But you know what? Sometimes it's not just about those smooth, blurry backgrounds. This is a nice image of a painted bunting where the leaves on the, the tree that it's on are nicely framing the bird. So don't be afraid to put things like that in, in your images. No different than this blue winged warbler on the red bud. Same tree. I love May when the warblers are coming through and the red buds are going crazy. Warblers on red buds. This is a cerulean warbler. Same kind of technique. Now this is the uh, last little setup right to the, uh, off to the right of this perch is a suet feeder at Whitefish Point. And this little flock of yellow rumped warblers we noticed came in and was going crazy on the suet. So I set up this little perch. Guess what's on the back side of the perch? My homemade suet. And they started hitting my perch more than the suet cake. And the end result is a gorgeous image.
Now, I'm going to go a little fast here because we're running out of time. This is a Michigan specialty, our Kirtland's Warbler. The only thing I want to say about this is don't be afraid of spending a lot of time. This took me years to get this image. I doing tour after tour after tour in the grayling area. Finally got a nice evening light shot on its jack pine habitat singing. I mean, it doesn't get any better for me. Be willing to put the time in. Don't be impatient for bird photography. You can't be or else you need to find a different subject. Always end with this. Don't be afraid to fail. We have to fail to get better. We have to fail to learn. So um, I'm here to tell you, this is one of my images. I have lots like this. There was a bird there at one point, I promise you. Uh, I don't know where it, where it is now or where it went. Same thing here. How many, how many blurry tree shots do you have where I think there's a bird somewhere in there? Now we can see, look at this little tree branch here is, is nicely in focus. And this bird here, which is a northern perula, obviously flew off right before I hit the shutter. Now we can see we've got this black-throated blue or black-throated green warbler was perched right here. Look at how uh, in focus this little perch is, and the birds hopped off, headed away. The famed butt shot, how many of these do you have? The nice thing though about this is we're at least starting to get into an area with a smoother background, nice little perch angle. And every now and then when you get a butt shot, a bird with its butt at you, just like this, be ready because oftentimes before they leave, they'll turn. This is the same bird. It happened to turn before it went and flew off and I was able to get the shot. So be watching for those opportunities and don't be afraid to wait, even though it's facing away from you. Sometimes they turn around before they fly off and you can capitalize on that moment. So to end tonight, I do want to um, give a selfless plug. Again, if you're interested in taking your Hawk ID, your Raptor ID to the next level, I offer a video, a movie that I, I authored um, that features raptors side by side on, on the screen at the same time, flying right next to each other. And I'm explaining how they're flying differently, how to identify those raptors, um, all while you're experiencing the video. So with that, I'm going to end and turn it over to Lauren, who hopefully can facilitate um, any questions we might have. Thanks, Josh. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, uh, we did have a couple of questions come in. Um, the first one was a question about um, where you're getting your flowers, specifically for the Arizona hummingbird. But I think more broadly, uh, it would be a good question to ask of, yeah, where are you sourcing your perches? So it depends. So for the hummingbirds, um, we grow wild columbine right here on our own prairie. So um, any columbine stuff I'm doing, I'm pulling from my own garden. So I don't have to ask permission. I just do do it without going, you know, cutting too many. Um, on the Arizona trip, the first place I went after we got groceries for our trip was like a local garden center. And I talked to them about, hey, what would be native in this area? And I bought a couple actual like potted plants to take up to the, the cabin area where we were up at um, Madera Canyon. Um, there was also some flowers on, on the edge of the property where we were staying that were uh, flowering naturally, and the owner let me clip a few of those as well. So it gave me a few different options, all of which I don't know what the flowers were. I can't tell you, but um, they were all native to the area. Cool. Um, I saw you answered the question about being related to another um, hoss. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, there's also a question about using sound to attract birds. Do you, you mentioned that you did not use that for some of these, but have you ever? Yeah, I do. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's one of those things that you have to, to be careful with it and not everybody agrees with it. So, um, you know, I'm not going to shy away and hide from it. Um, there are times when I do use audio. Um, I tend to use it pretty sparingly. Um, and it, you know, audio tends to only really work when the birds are on territory. And so ethically you run this risk of, um, taking them away that you're, you're, um, making them use energy to come in and look for what they think is another male singing. So you do need to be careful with it. Um, 
like I said, the first thing that I do when I approach a situation is I try to just watch the birds for what they're doing. And if at all possible, try to capitalize on what they're doing naturally, especially songbirds. If they're on territory, they typically have perches or kind of like a circle that they'll, they'll repetitively fly in, you know, holding their territory. And so if you can find one of those perches where they're hitting often, um, that helps. That doesn't always hold true for migration. So when you're talking about like these Northern Perulas and Blackburnians where they're, they're not singing on territory, they're singing, but they're just coming through, uh, that's not gonna happen. And in some cases, some audio might work. I find that I'll, if I come upon an individual, I might play a song um, and I'll just, I'll play it once and I'll watch the reaction of the bird. And more often than not, you know, the bird, they, they might kind of stay at canopy level. They might come over and look around and then go back to what they're doing. I'm out. That bird's not going to do anything. There's no sense in sitting there playing audio over and over and over. That bird's never going to come down. Um, I like to hit, if I'm going to use audio, like I said, it's sparingly. And I like to hit um, the bird's territory area, like leading up to when they arrive. They are so much more cooperative right when they get back from migration, as opposed to they've set up their territory, they're in the canopy, they're doing their thing. They already know they have a mate, they already have a territory, they're less likely to, to go crazy. So um, those are just a few tips. Just again, be very careful, read about whether or not that's something you wanna do or not. Yeah, good, good point. I definitely don't wanna disturb their natural behavior. Um, was, as, you, as you mentioned, many of your photos were of them acting natural, so. Um, next question is uh, from a Dan Burton, who um, we see often. Uh, do you take photos at M&A sites? And if so, do you have any favorites? Ooh, you put me on the spot. I think there's an M&A site in the Southwest corner. I forget what it's called. It's really popular for woodland wildflowers and trillium and things like that. I think it's an M&A site. Um, the name escapes me, but, um, there's some wood thrush that like to hang in there that can be good. Um, but most of the time when I'm going to that site, I'm literally going after trillium and other woodland wildflowers. So I'm, I'm in a different mode and that's a, actually brings up a good point. I always approach a situation with a goal and sometimes, you know, like that solitary sandpiper, we were there photographing landscapes and waterfalls you know, it presented itself. I, I was able to run and get my bird lens and was able to get it done. But most of the time I, I have a goal. And so my example there was my goal is for woodland wildflowers. So I wasn't there shooting birds, but there were wood thrush everywhere. And I always thought, oh, if I want a wood thrush shot, that's probably the place I'm going to go. <laughs> I wish I could remember the name of that site. Yeah, that's quite all right. Um, you can look it up um, on our website. We have a map. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, all right, so uh, next question from Sarah. Are there any activities that you can recommend for young children to do um, to get them into wildlife photography? Well, that's a great question. So that's something that I'm experiencing. I didn't have enough time to really get deep into some of the things I'm doing with my daughter uh, right with respect to this right now, but great question. Um, probably the biggest thing that I would recommend is you're probably someone like me and you have an iPhone or some sort of phone with a camera in your pocket at all times. Um, you know, bring your kids into taking photos with your phone or, or, you know, go somewhere and find a really cheap digital camera. Even if it takes awful quality images, the kids really don't care. I found you know, my daughter is getting images with this little point and shoot that we got her for very inexpensive investment. And she absolutely loves it. She carries it with her everywhere she goes. And a lot of that spawned from, remember that Kestrel shot where I said my daughter and I were in a tent? I set up some feeders near the Kestrel area. We were taking, and I had been feeding in this little spot for probably two weeks. And then we went into the tent and with her little camera, because she can't be that far away, we're, you know, five, six feet from the feeders and the birds are coming in and she's getting shots of, you know, red winged blackbirds and chickadees and cardinals. And, you know, a, a six year old doesn't know that that's a common bird. Look how close that is, dad. I mean, they're so excited. So think of it so much simpler 
than a lot of, you know, some of the things that we, we talked about tonight. You don't need big lenses. You don't need expensive gear. Get out your phone. Let them just play with it. Experience taking photos of flowers and, you know, anything natural, even in your yard. And you'll be surprised at how quickly they get excited about what they're doing. So the last thing I'll say on that, I know we're running short on time, is uh, my daughter has gotten so excited about taking these images. I have uh, given family and friends calendars for probably, I don't know, 14, 15 years now. Every Christmas, that's kind of a gift we give to friends and family. And so she has started to take uh, one of the months is, is hers every year. So she gets at the end of the year, she gets to go through all her favorite images and decide which ones get to go in the calendar. And so that becomes this kind of um, really fun time at the end of the year for her to go through everything that she photographed throughout that year. And we get to talk about where we were and what we saw and what we experienced. And that's kind of a, a cool way to re-experience it. So. That sounds like a lot of fun. Awesome. Washiak Woods. Do yep, that's it. Yeah, do Woods. Put there. Yeah. Yep. You if you say Trillium, yeah, that's pretty much what everyone's gonna say. Do Washiak Woods. So is that an MA site? It is. Yep. Sweet. Okay. It is. But so uh, we were actually there. Um, you may have seen on our social media feed. Uh, we had a turtle dog survey there in July. Um, that we did a little short clip video of the turtles, or sorry, the dogs in action looking for the turtles. So um all kinds of fun things happening there. <laughs> Very cool. So, all right, well, we will um, wrap up by just thanking everyone for attending. Thank you, Josh, for your uh, wonderful presentation. I know I will definitely use some of these tips um, when I'm out taking pictures. So it's uh, great to see all your photos and definitely some helpful advice. Um, Want to remind everyone that we have more of these presentations coming up. Um, our next one is Thursday, October 28th. Um, we are going to hear from Dr. Rolf Peterson, who leads the wolf uh, moose study on Isle Royal. Um, so if you haven't already, please uh, go to michiganature.org and sign up for that. And uh, with that, we will end. And please watch um, for the recording in your email and share with your friends if you like. <laughs>